So welcome everyone. Um, this is our third session and our last session possibly um, in our training session on organizing virtual events. We're so happy that so many of you have been able to participate in the previous sessions and we are particularly super excited about this one because um, we have some guest speakers and it's also a topic that uh, hands to heart me and Mara are kind of new to so this is also a session where we will learn a lot um, and it's going to be quite a lot of fun for us as well um, I think while before I'm gonna for those of you who are not following my screen and prefer to follow the virtual presentation I put the link in the chat box um, it's going to be the same uh, but yeah uh, if you have any issues, please do let us know. Before starting, we want to tell you about our house rules that we have. Um, and these house rules can be found on, link on slide one. Um, and it's one person speaks at a time, as you know. Mute your mic when you're not talking. Please identify yourself by name every time you speak. Turn off your videos so that everyone can participate. And don't speak too fast. Um, and please don't interrupt the speaker's flow. If you do have any comments, we encourage you to raise your hand. Those who attended our last session would know by now how to raise your hand. But if you um, have, for example, never done this before, there is an easy way to do it by clicking Alt Y or to click on your name and click on the More button and then uh, raise your hand. Uh, also, if you have a slow bandwidth, we recommend you turning off any other programs that are heavy um, that might uh, use up a lot of your bandwidth, as well as, um, uh, yeah, let us know if we're going too fast or if you agree, um, then you can add plus and minus signs in the chat box. So plus sign means that you agree with the speaker, minus sign means that you disagree with the speaker, and if you want to ask a question, you can do so in the chat and we will table it for you or answer them directly like we've done in previous sessions. We will also, um, yeah, try and see if we can respond to any questions you might have through emails as well. Our accessibility uh, contact is Mara, so it's mara at widow.org. And yeah, let's start. So many of you are already familiar with Padlet, so we're on slide two. For those of you who are not familiar with Padlet, and this is optional, you don't have to use this. Um, Padlet looks like this. It's a little virtual tool that you can use to identify who, who you are. Um, when you get to the slide, you have to enter the password sunshine. Once you've clicked on sunshine, you add your own by clicking on this plus sign at the bottom. Sorry, let's do that again. So at the bottom of the screen, there's a plus sign on the right hand side. And there's five questions that you should answer. So first you write your name, I'm Hannah, and preferably your last name as well, if you want to. Your email, so my email, blah, blah, blah. And then your organization, your country, I'm Swedish, but living in Germany. And what do you want to learn from today's session to stay safe? I don't know, anything. Uh, you can, if you want to play around with this, uh, we strongly invite you to do so. And the way you send it off is just by uh, leaving it and then it's saved. So do please take a moment throughout either now or at the end of this presentation to add your details. If you have any issues, uh, Mara will respond to you in the chat box as per normal. We're trying to stay to one hour, but we're running a little bit later today. Um, and as always, if you can stay longer, we do realize you have a lot of other calls happening at the moment. But if you can stay longer, we do appreciate uh, as we might foresee it over uh, taking a little bit longer than just one hour. Okay, so I want to invite you all to find your, yourself and be present in the moment. I would 
Now I'd like to invite you to maybe take a pause from Padlet and remove your distractions. If you haven't already, grab a beverage, take out some note-taking stuff or just generally center yourself. And while you do that, I invite you to come to slide four. Have a look into the grass if you can. Um, that's on the, the slide and just enjoy the little photo you have in front of you as we take five deep breaths together. And again, this time I invite you to turn on your microphone so I can hear you breathe. So five breaths and look at the photo you have in front of you and starting now. So deep breath in. Great, that was five breaths and I welcome you so much to this session and I hope you can find yourself centered and prepared for the many interesting things we have ahead of us. And, and I'm happy to have so many on you on this call again. We are now on slide five for those of you following the agenda. And, and what we are going to discuss today is we're going to have a little think about why are we so focus on digital safety in this session and why is it important to us all. Um, then after we have that agenda setting for this important call, we would like to introduce you to our really great speakers that we're so excited to have on board. And together we will have a look at what are the feminist principles of the internet and how do we practice safety online. And then we will have a question and answering session at the end. Again, uh, I do want to stress that please don't interrupt, don't interrupt the speakers. Um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or leave them in the chat box so that we can table them for the question session at the end. Um, and then at, at the end of this slide, you, we will have a feedback slide where you can leave comments on things that you still would like to learn more about. And yeah, welcome everyone. As I hand this over to Mara and take over the chat commenting. Thank you, Hannah. So great to see all of you this morning or hear all of your voices as we <laughs> breathe together. Um, so I just want to offer some framing comments. Um, so Hannah and I have tried to emphasize on our other two calls, if you've been able to join, that this call will look a little different. While the last two weeks have been a bit more straightforward with tips and tricks and best practices that we can share from our experiences, this topic looks just a little bit different. And I know that we're all here because we know digital safety is important, right? We're probably also interested in this topic because we've seen a whole range of headlines similar to these in the news recently. Uh, do you mind switching to the next slide, Hannah? And make, this makes us feel like in this time of global lockdown, when so many of us are in quarantine are, and are using our internet for more and more purposes every day, we're more at risk than ever, that the internet is unsafer than ever. But what do we even mean when we say unsafe, right? There can be so many things that are brought up here for people. Fear of Zoom bombing, which is when trolls drop into your Zoom calls unwelcome to spew hate, or it could be fear that, that large corporations that own these platforms are taking down information about you. It could also just be a fear that you don't know how to use the tools available to, your to be your best self and participate fully. And that's also a valid fear. So all of these fears can hurt our ability to host and participate in virtual organizing and virtual meetings right now, which is what we're trying to grow our skills in. We might not be able to get rid of all of these fears, but it's important to try to talk about them and find strategies to try. So Hannah and I were able to talk you through some tips and tricks for keeping your virtual meetings safe in the last call, which included things like when and how to use registration, how to use waiting rooms to allow entrance to calls, how to mute and kick out people who are disruptive or hateful and more. We want you all to feel empowered using those tools and we know that there's a lot more at hand around fear and our use of the internet right now than just being like a whiz and a master at Zoom. 
Um, so that's why we brought in some experts. It's really reassuring to me, and I'll speak for Hannah as well, to know that there have been feminists all over the world who've been thinking about what a feminist internet looks like and how feminists can better navigate the internet and its complexity for literally years, if not decades. So this is the time, and I can't reiterate this enough, to lean on their expertise. So I'm really excited to welcome our guest speakers today who will be sharing um, a few of their thoughts on these questions around safety and connection to each other on the internet right now, as well as sharing some skills. So I'm going to pass it off to Hannah to give some um, info on each of these incredible speakers that we're going to be hearing from today. Thank you so much, Mara. Um, I'm getting questions about us slowing down. So as I uh, invite our speakers to speak, I just, um, yeah, please try and keep to not speaking too fast. So um, yeah, it's with my great honor that I introduce Jennifer Radloff, who is the Women's Human Rights uh, Program and Capacity Building Lead at the Association for Progressive Communications, APC, and Erika Smith, who is the Women's Rights Program uh, in Mexico Capacity Building and Networking Coordinator, and who's been very active in Take Back the Tech, who also works for the APC. And for those of you who are new to APC, it's really the organization when you think about the feminist internet and the way we are envisioning it. And they have been doing, they are doing loads of capacity building on and conceptualizing on what is it uh, that we think of when we define feminist internet. And without taking too much space and, and talk about how I conceptualize this, I'd like to hear directly from our two speakers. So welcome on board. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Mara. And hello, everybody. Um, it's a real honor to be here. And I had a look at the people who are participating in the call. And there are lots of allies and partners, which is, is really good to hear. Um, well, good to know. Um, so, as uh, uh, Hannah said, I work for the uh, Association for Progressive uh, Communications uh, Women's Rights Program. Um, and just to start off, I really want to appreciate uh, you starting off with, uh, with the breathing, um, because it's something that we're trying to do in our work, is to really center um, the politics and practice of uh, collective and, and self-care. Um, also, I, I don't really see myself as an expert, but um, someone who's been, as a feminist activist, been engaged in um, internet rights for, for quite a while. And um, yeah, so the way that Erica and I thought about this is that I'm going to present um, around uh, how we and why we got to the feminist principles of the internet. Um, and then talk a little bit to digital safety. Um, uh, and there are a lot of people on this call that can actually contribute a lot. So I hope that we can have a time for uh, contributions as well as questions and, and answers. Um, and also I'd just like to start off by, by saying that we find ourselves in a really complicated time at the moment. I mean, in lockdown with the COVID-19 pandemic and all the systemic injustices that, that arise from that. So I just want to want to acknowledge that. Um, and the second thing I also want to acknowledge is that, um, you know, when we talk about digital safety and we talk about technology, often that brings up a lot of um, anxiety and a lot of fear because a lot of us have been socialized into believing that we are not good enough when it comes to technology. Um, so just to say that we try and approach um, this thing called technology and digital safety as something that we can play with and have agency and um, be creative about. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to just also start off by saying that um, the work that we do is not just the work of APC or the Women's Rights Program. APC is a, is a network of organizations, mostly in the global south, that do incredible work. So... Um, APC as an organization um, really benefits from that. Um, and also to say that the feminist principles of the internet, our work around digital safety, really is um, the collective wisdom and experience and effort of all our allies and partners, um, some of whom, as I said, are on this call. Um, and another thing I want to also acknowledge is um, 
my identity and location, because I think that's really important as, as activists that we, that we acknowledge that because it comes with certain privileges and, and power. So, um, yeah, and again, in APC, we're really lucky because we get to engage with a diverse range of activists. Um, so we can aggregate that, that wisdom. Um, okay, to dive in, um, the Women's Rights Program has been around for sure, nearly 28 years, and we've always walk, worked as activists um, in this terrain of, of the internet. Um, and we try and bring a feminist lens and analysis to all our work, um, and that work is done in collaboration. Um, and we are at the moment and have been for a couple of years troubling the question, what does it mean to build movements in the digital age? Um, and how do we challenge the, the white, the male, the usually northern control and ownership of the internet um, at every level from infrastructure to content to ownership um, management? Um, and how do we make a, a feminist internet? Um, so I think a lot of what I'm going to speak to is around this thing around power and agency um, and how do we claim that um, when we, we talk about the internet. Um, so what I'm going to do is speak first of all to the feminist principles of the internet and then um, go on to talk about um, uh, our approach to, to digital safety. Um, and then we can take some questions. So. Apologies if I talk um, for a long time, but hopefully some of it's going to be interesting. And then what we want to do after questions and answers is to see if we have time to talk a little bit about um, a couple of tools and practices around safety, because it's a, it's a huge um, terrain. Um, and if I'm going to also keep an eye on the chat box in case anything comes up. Okay, so um, what are the feminist principles of the internet and how can we use them? So we're working in uh, internet rights. Uh, what we've been trying to do is to bring sexual rights activists, women's rights activists, women human rights defenders together with internet rights activists because we need to look at that kind of cross-movement dialogue in order to inform each other's uh, activism. So we developed the feminist principles of the internet um, in order to provide, provide a framework for women's movements to articulate and explore issues related to um, technology. So basically the feminist principles of the internet are a series of statements that offer a gender and a sexual rights lens on, on critical internet uh, related rights. Um, and as I mentioned before, we always try and work in partnership. Um, and I think I noticed a couple of people on the call that were actually at one of the two meetings we had. So in 2014, we brought together a range of activists, a lot of whom were sexual rights activists, LGBTQI activists, um, to imagine what a feminist internet would look like. Because there's always this kind of dragging feeling that the internet is something that is alien or it's really um, masculine. And we wanted to really imagine what a feminist internet would look like. So 2014, we uh, brought activists together and we, through amazing processes of, of discussion, we came up with 15 principles um, that could guide and provide a framework for us to, to look and explore um, internet related issues. Um, and then in 27, 2016, we brought together another group and we um, then kind of spoke through the princip principles, updated them. And we've currently got 17 principles. These are organized into different clusters, access, movements, economy, expression, and embodiment. Um, and, you know, these are not cast in stone, um, but these are iterative. They are principles that can be used to try and understand um, our position and um, our place and how we trouble that place in, in this um, internet space um, and what we what we are doing and i know a lot of people on this call are are engaged in in environmental activism um, so we are busy working on an 18th principle on the environment which um, we obviously would like to aggregate your wisdom um, around um, i'm not going to talk, I was going to talk to one of the, the principles on access, but maybe we can come to that a bit later. 
Um, but what, what we're currently doing with the feminist principles um, is localizing them. So what we did after the development and the publishing of the principles, and we'll share all the, the links to the websites, is to um, ask partners to localize the feminist principles because the language can be a bit inaccessible. So what we've done is trans our partners have translated them into a couple of languages. Partners have hosted a, a local conversations where they've looked at which principles um, speak to their realities and their contexts and have seen how they can use the frame their engagement with technology um, from a feminist perspective. We are busy developing uh, what we're calling the FBI engagement toolkit, uh, which people can use in their contexts. Um, and as I said, we are busy um, developing a principle on, uh, on the environment. Um, and just to acknowledge that this work uh, was started last year by activists in, based in Mexico. Uh, so an invitation to you, you apart from asking questions, um, we really are asking people to engage with the FPIs to translate them into different languages, send them case studies. Um, and also in, earlier on, I spoke to this issue of power. Um, we really try and encourage activists to engage in policy spaces like the Internet Go Governance Forum. Um, in my conversation with uh, Hannah and Mara in planning this presentation, and they mentioned that um, many people engage in UN spaces um, to take the issue of um, a feminist approach to technology into um, policy spaces because we really need to talk um, power in these policy spaces. Otherwise, they're completely dominated by, um, yeah, by people that are controlling them, which are usually white, male, and northern. Um, yeah, and that's something that we're really committed to, is bringing people into these spaces. Um, yeah, um, so those are, that's something around the feminist principles, just to kick us off. Um, and I see on the screen that we've got the slide I prepared on, on access. Um, so that's just an example of, of uh, one of the principles and one of the clusters, um, which is, is access, which seems to be one of the most uh, pressing ones, because as we know, access is so um, uh, defined by location, by gender, by identity, um, by access to resources. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do just in the interest of time is to, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, so this is just an example of um, one of the local conversations that was, was held in, in Zimbabwe with some of our uh, activist colleagues um, and you can read uh, the article there's a link there but um, as I said I'll share all these articles with you um, yeah so I'm going to segue into um, just a couple of thoughts around digital safety um, and then we can maybe have a discussion about um, and see where the energy is in in this call um, whether we talk FBI's or digital safety or, or both so what, do you, what you're seeing on the screen is another collaborative um, engagement, um, which is called the uh, Feminist Technology Exchange Safety Reboot. Um, and it's something that we um, developed with our partners. It's a training curriculum for feminist trainers around uh, digital safety. Um, and I'll speak a bit more to that. Um, but just to say that uh, in relation to digital safety, um, we really want, we start off with the politics and practice of, of care. Because as I said earlier, that um, these spaces can be so fraught and even the naming of digital security um, really makes the sense of our safety having to be militarized. Um, so we're trying to, to kind of trouble that and look at digital safety as something that is um, something that we can take control of. Um, and we really do believe in a holistic discourse around um, feminist self-defense and self and collective care that doesn't distinguish between online and offline activism. And I think that's really important to, to bear in mind because um, you know, all, all of the violences that are happening and when we talk of digital safety, we have to really root um, online gender-based violence as core to a lot of the 
um, attacks that happen online. Um, that our online and offline activism is not separate because the two of them are part of a continuum. That the violence we experience online can lead to offline um, experiences of violence and, and vice versa. So um, in relation to, to our capacity building work with digital safety, we really um, try and emphasize exchange, that there's not one size fits all in relation to digital safety because our experiences um, of safety differ. Um, we really try to emphasize sharing, peer learning, creating safe spaces. And as we know, safe spaces mean different things to different people. And we really try and approach this with a, a sense of fun um, and um, an agency. Um, sorry, I'm just reading through my notes. Um, so in relation to the internet, it's a space where for many years, activists have gone to, to find safety and community recognition um, to have uh, consensual sex. It's a creative space. Um, but when that space is under threat, it really is a reminder of how fraught uh, the questions of safety are more generally. Um, so it's another reason why we really need to claim the space um, as a space of of pleasure and fun and safety and why digital safety is so important and why we need to interrogate this ownership and control of these, of these um, spaces. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few more thoughts. Uh, digital safety responses really means investigating and changing how we approach working in our movements. And this is really important because um, as I mentioned the principle on access, in our movements, we have differing access to the internet. So we need, really need to be sure that we're not excluding people within our movements who have less access or have a, a different relationship to, to technology, um, who feel um, you know, uncomfortable and really have a kind of, um, as we say in South Africa, an each one teach one response to, to technology. Um, it's very, very, we're all very aware, particularly now, um, that governments are surveilling us more so than ever. I mean, women human, right, human rights defenders are always under the microscope. Um, they're always being tracked and surveilled. We know this. Um, so we need to be, in these days, really um, mindful of what's happening around COVID-19 and how tracking is being used as something, and, and, and I'm not saying that it's, it shouldn't happen, that some of it is, is good, but often what happens is extraordinary measures are brought in, in times of crisis around surveillance and tracking. And often after the pandemic has ended or after the crisis, those regulations and laws stick. So we need to be very mindful of that. And it's also another reason why <clears throat> the policy arena is so important. Um, another thing to bear in mind is that we often tend to worry, um, to not worry about our own personal risk as activists. But I just want to remind us, we really need to be careful, um, particularly in the digital space, because we need to take care of ourselves because we are part of connected communities. So it's kind of um, important that we all take care of ourselves in order to show up for our communities and keep our communities safe. And as we all know, that's true of the digital as well as the offline um, and spiritual spaces as well. Um, there are safer alternatives to a lot of the tools that we use, um, and we really have a, a political commitment as feminists working in the inter internet space to free and open source software. Proprietary software comes with its own problems, but the caveat is that sometimes there are tools that we have to use because they just are not other tools, and sometimes the um, free and open source tools can be uh, difficult to access or we don't understand them. So many activists use Facebook, WhatsApp, and we don't want to say, ah, you know, danger, danger, don't use them. Just be mindful of how you use them. Understand the privacy settings and be as safe as you can. Um, because there is not one safe alternative to, to, to anything, really. Um, and just a little few more responses. Um, at this moment in our lives, we are hyper-connected. So we need to be aware of how much we're using techn technology. 
I mean, simple things that um, Hannah and Mara highlighted in the beginning, you know, take a break, breathe. Um, this constant flow of information is, is um, it can be exhausting. So take breaks, um, stretch, be, be careful, drink water, all of those things, and be gentle with ourselves at all times when it comes to technology. Um, another thing is curiosity. I think as feminists, we are aware of creativity and curiosity. So be curious about safer alternatives and make time to explore them in your collectives. Um, there's some very good tools and apps that are out there that hopefully we can get to at some point. Um, and that our, our practices are really important when it comes to, comes to um, tools and apps. Um, and behavior change, obviously important to check our, our behavior when we're around technology and to be very mindful about the implications of using technology in different instances. Um, and if you're based in a collective or an organization, explore things together and don't set up one person as the person that has to take charge of all your, your technology. Um, a very, very key um, point and what we try and do in all our, our convenings is become familiar with how the internet works. Know who is behind the technology, know who owns the social media, and know who is controlling, owning, that space, who's putting out the information, um, because that gives us so much more power. So maybe set up a learning space where you learn how the internet works, how your mobile phones work. It really is, is, a, is a good thing to do. Um, and I've already mentioned, you know, strategizing from a place when we can, because often it's not possible, but strategize from a place of pleasure and fun rather than from risk and threat. I mean, it's easy to say, but it, it really, it, it puts a different spin on things. Um, and we've seen that, you know, in our, our workshop spaces, um, if we can um, find pleasure and creativity and fun when we're looking at digital safety, it really, it gives us a, a different energetic and practical response. Um, key to this is listening and respecting the experiences of people with different identities and locations and seeing that as an opportunity for learning because as i said earlier there's not a kind of one size fits all and we all experience this differently um, those of you who are trainers and this is something really close to my heart is foster local capacity um, and relational networks of support uh, within your communities around digital safety and build a collective knowledge and ownership with the um, uh, FTX Safety Reboot, uh, it's an example of a collective wisdom and knowledge that was brought together and shared. And really know that because um, our conditions and context change, as does technology, that these resources need to be agile and iterative and respond um, all the time. Um, to support uh, trainers in your movements, um, to become a trainer, to learn about digital safety, to teach um, each other. And then I just want to say one more thing around um, needs assessments or what we also call risk assessments. They're very, very useful tools to use to begin to understand um, what your conditions are in relation to digital safety. What are the tools you use? Who do you communicate with? How do you store your information? And then start exploring and reaching out to feminist trainers, um, digital safety trainers about what different alternatives there potentially are. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I've spoken for a long time and I, I think it would be really good if we could maybe listen to other people's inputs or, or questions. And if we've got time, maybe Erica can speak to some of these alternatives. Um, there are a couple of other slides. Sorry, I, I, didn't, oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I didn't direct you to change the slides. But basically, I've just, um, if we can just go through them, there are a couple more. This is our Take Back the Tech campaign, which Erica coordinates. Um, a lot of collective wisdom there and strategies and campaigns. Um, next one is another example of a toolkit um, around digital safety developed by, by feminists. Um, Next slide. Um, okay, this is a, just a, what I find quite inspirational. It's our second femin Making a Feminist Internet convene Convening, Resistance, Hacking, Security and Care. Just an example of some of the knowledge that's on our Gender IT website, which is also a collective wisdom. Um, next slide. 
Um, okay, this is just kind of three key issues for a feminist internet. Uh, access agency and movements, a really good article. Um, I think I'm just going to stop there and, and see how we can take questions. And I really would ask people who are here who've been to the convenings or know more to please weigh in because Erica and I, um, I also wanted to say that I'm, we probably won't be able to answer all your questions, but we'll do our best. And if we can't, we'll go back to our team and, and respond. So thank you very much for your patience and listening. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, that was quite a lot of really useful information and, and bigger picture ideas. We did get quite a lot of uh, um, questions. Some of them are very specifically addressed, I think, to Erica, who can speak a little bit more on the practicality. But um, so for those of you following my screen, for others, we are on slide 25. Um, so what are some examples of safety issues? Uh, and please respond in non-techno language is one question we got. Um, and then another question we got was, um, sorry, no, uh, we have several questions here. Um, so if you find yourself in a place of fear and about how insecure the internet is, like how do you tackle that fear and, and what do you do? And what are safety alternatives? But I think this might be one for Erica, the tools and apps. Do we have any other one who has specifically questions on uh, the resources that Jenny has been talking about now and the, the conceptualization of uh, a feminist internet and how we can all come together and in a place of care, but also in a place of moment building. If in that case, I invite you now to either raise your hand or to turn on your mic and ask them directly. Okay, I don't see anything yet. So then maybe Jenny, if you can just take some time to address those two questions. Okay, can you repeat them, please, Hannah? Yeah. So, what are some examples of safety issues? And please respond in non techno language. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the key things that we say in workshops. And, you know, number one is that don't speak in techno speak, which is often difficult when you're so steeped in something. And the yeah. other one is no question is a wrong question. Yeah. Um, so, some examples. I mean, I would really like to ask people on the call who've experienced. Um, in, you know, uh, situations of insecurity to also speak. But I mean, for example, you know, Zoom bombing is one of the things. Um, another thing which Erica could speak to and from Take, take Back the Tech um, is um, extortion, sextortion. It's a, a non-consensual distribution you, of intimate images. Okay. Sorry, Jenny, what is sextortion for those who don't know what this is? What this Okay, I'm going to hand over to Erica to respond to that because she's much more steeped in this. So sorry okay. about the take note. <laughs> Erica. If you can unmute yourself. Can, yes, yes. I'm using the Zoom app on my phone. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Erica. I'm also not using video because I'm based in Mexico and I also find that if we add video to this mix, it makes the connection a lot less stable and I'm likely to get booted off. And perhaps you can tell by my voice that I am actually not Mexican. I am from the United States. I have a Midwestern accent from Detroit, Michigan, but I have lived in Mexico for 30 years and have been working on um, issues of, of first connectivity, uh, getting uh, women online in even before the Beijing conference. So I'm also locating myself as a very privileged US woman living in a different country <laughs> and who's older than many of you and happy to be so. But I've had a long trajectory with technology. And I think one of the important spaces and places where we feel unsafe especially women who are perhaps over 30 or, or maybe not even, but especially in different countries throughout Latin America, Africa, uh, uh, South Asia, Asia, if you have not had the ability to have access to technology, it doesn't necessarily mean that you feel safe with it. And when mysterious things happen and in languages that you are not your um, maternal language, uh, are happening uh, or in a techno language, it makes you feel further unsafe. 
Um, so when we were talking about, you know, feeling safe, you know, people don't often think of technology as a space and a site <laughs> or even language where they might feel safe. So really um, appreciate your patience with us in, in terms of if we're using jargon and, and, and being willing to face off with that. And I won't say that all younger women uh, have uh, and, and gender diverse uh, people have um, had a longer experience with technology or a more comfortable experience with technology, but they may have grown up with it uh, as, as a more um, natural framing for their lives and interaction with it more automatically than some other women who uh, didn't have access or when technology didn't exist. So I think that's an important aspect because it can feel very alien and affects our sense of safety. And then I think on that is since technology tries to do a lot of things for you uh, and in quote the solutions that are offered tend to assume you don't want to know what's going on behind the screen and 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 frequently we don't because we just want to get stuff done um, the uh, it's hard to understand technology a little bit deeper as as Jenny was encouraging you know how to, how does the internet work how does our mobile phone work and yet we do very personal and private things on these devices and we take them with us to personal and private spaces like our bedrooms and everywhere we go. If we have a smartphone, a cell phone, um, or uh, if we're using laptops, et cetera, or sometimes because we don't have access, we bring personal things into our work devices. So there's always a crossover between personal and private and some of our work in more public spheres. And so when there are uh, breaches or threatening attacks on what we're trying to do, when we feel like we're in a private space, it's perhaps even more shocking for some. Um, so going very back, back to the very specific question of sextortion. Sextortion came out of, um, uh, it's combining two words, sex and extortion. Um, and it is basically requiring either sexual images, sex talk, sex acts, uh, in exchange for not releasing information about you. And frequently the information that would be released about you is related to sexuality, is related to private aspects of either your identity or of intimate photos that, that someone may have gotten a hold of. And so unfortunately what happens with sextortion and although there are different ways that people define uh, the actual process and in fact in different criminal codes it is differently defined. Some people say it's exacting money so as not to release sexual images. Um, and others say that it is exacting um, more images or, or actual live se sessions chats. And I think what a lot of people do not realize is that while it feels like you might be having a wonderful and very exciting private exchange, even a live exchange on many different services, the other person can be recording it and might not even be that person that you think you're having an intimate relationship with. It might not even be the video, I mean, the video image that you're seeing. So it's, a, um, it's one of the incredible ways that people are deceived, especially youth, especially children, uh, but not limited to um, having a sexual acts that they, they are interested in and curious about, but the person that they're doing this with or the people that they're involved with may or may not be who they think they are. So it, it's, it's hard because um, I, I think that the women's rights program in the Association for Progressive Communications in this area of sexuality and the internet has done a lot of work around sexual rights in the internet, sexual expression, access to information in so many countries, sites where you can even find out about pregnancy, about breast cancer, about um, orgasm, about uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, being queer, uh, about incest. Many of these sites are automatically blocked in so many countries. So even access to information in our sexuality and internet research has been a key issue. And we approach, um, and since we also work in gender-based violence online, we see also that very protectionist need to want to prevent violence and protect people. But our response tries not to be protectionist. It tries to be preventative, yes, uh, full of the strategies and solutions that come from women's rights and queer activists, uh, gender diverse people's strategies and our own experience and that of other advocates. Um, but it is 
really trying not to erase rights or shut women off, especially as people to be protected uh, as a marginal and vulnerable population, because frequently efforts to protect us mean don't go online. It's not safe for our girls to use the internet. The internet is a bad place. And rather our discourse is the internet is a marvelous place where a lot of nasty shit happens. How can we prepare ourselves better? And I think a lot of the questions that you're showing uh, in the chat and otherwise are asking questions like that. We can talk about, I hope I've defined sextortion. And I know I saw a lot of questions about, well, what are these safety alternatives? Specific questions about video conferencing um, and also some questions about websites. So, and I, I know there are some other questions out there. I do wanna say, I just wanna say very basic things right now that perhaps all of us are thinking about or think we do well, but it's always important to mention them. And I think it's really important to have an antivirus on all of your devices, including your phone. It is really important to have your um, system, your operating system of your phone, of your computer, up to date because there are important security patches that happen with those operating systems. We find that those systems which are more popular are gonna be under more attack. So you see a lot more viruses circulating on Windows systems, for example, or right now, a lot of attacks are focused on Zoom because it is a popular platform. Um, both Jenny and I use open source software we use uh, a Linux operating system, so it's not a Mac, it's not a Windows operating system, and it is less vulnerable to particularly virus attack. This is as an example. An important and huge recommendation is your backups. Before you do anything, you should always be backing up your information, backing up what's important for you on your phone, backing up what's important for you on your computers, in your mail system, and I think it's really important to understand that if you get attacked and some information in, in a particular attack might be lost, if you have a backup, the attack can uh, disrupt your life a bit less. So that's why as well backups are important. And when we think about those devices which are mobile, which are going with us, um, we need to think about, and, and, and that are connected to the internet, we do need to think about protecting them with passwords and strong passwords. And I can talk more about what I consider to be a strong password and what others um, are talking about in strong passwords. I think we've all heard about how to uh, apply a strong password. Um, but how much we do it is, a, is, a, is an important question. But the, the um, well, let me just say that the stereotypical response is it's long. And many people, when you ask for, for different people, long passwords, people will say, you guys can think about it yourself. Maybe you wanna throw in there, you know, what's a long password for you? Uh, what's important in the length of a password for you? It's changed over the years because technology changes. And this points to also what Jenny was saying about practice and process. Things we might recommend today will become vulnerable over time. So this isn't an idea that you can say, oh, I did this today and so now I'm safe. Safety is also a process. It's always going to change. And there will be very smart people who try to attack in different ways. So recommendations for passwords have gone from eight characters to 16 characters or even longer. And yes, we've all heard about the mixing up of capital letters, lowercase letters, using punctuation in our systems. But if we've gone from that recommendation of passwords, which is very important, to recommending passphrases and applying a systems that's personalized to you. Um, and I can go into more calm, slow detail about that or point you to an online resource about that um, because it is incredibly important to have good passwords and to put them on everything. Because as I was saying, if you go out and your phone is stolen, then if it has a password on it, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to extract the information. Maybe they will just wipe it clean and resell as opposed to looking at vital information that could be important. So we want to put as many deterrents on access to inf our information as possible. And on that, in that vein, um, I wanted to mention that on our cell phones, we carry a lot of information and we should be thinking about keeping them a little bit tidier. 
questioning if all of the photos that are on there we want to keep on there, questioning if we've had sensitive chats, especially now when many people are working from home. Um, in private chats, do they need to stay on there if someone gets access to our phone? Should we be erasing them? All of this is linked to reflecting about the information and devices that we use, what's important to us, what would be sensitive for us or for other people, what would we worry about if it went public, and what steps can we take in our practice to help protect and, and take collective care, not only of our information, our data, but those of the people that we're interacting with. People talked about protecting their websites. Indeed, if you use um, a particular platform, keeping that platform up to date, for example, um, if you're using a content management system or a blog system, you want to keep it up to date. WordPress, for example, people literally scroll around the internet looking, they troll for people who haven't updated their WordPresses and attack. Um, so it's, it's also a lot about, sometimes attacks are not personalized, they are taking advantage, but we do know that feminists women human rights defenders, sexual rights activists are under incredible scrutiny. And so people are looking for any point of weakness. And one of the things that anyone who wants to do an informational attack will look at is, is their software up to date? Is their website up to date? So let's just imagine if you have a current up to date um, WordPress or whatever your system is for your website, and if you have a backup of that website, any attack will be less damaging to you. It will be a royal pain to recover from, without a doubt, but it will be less damaging to you. And if you have strong password systems, which again, we can point you to more information or go into more detail if you like, then the likelihood of people getting access to your website or to your accounts without your consent is also more difficult. So I know this is a quick basic introduction to some aspects of of, of digital safety. I hope it hasn't been um, too uh, technical in terms of terminology, but I do want to go back to some of the specific questions. Pausing now, though. Perfect. Erica, this is very useful. No, I don't think you spoke too fast, and I think you covered a lot of things. But if, if people do find that Erika spoke too fast, we are covering this in the minutes uh, that we will share it after the session. Um, I think you touched on a couple of really important things, and we did get a lot of questions in the chat. So uh, one of the questions was, is software like LastPass reliable? Uh, another one was uh, directed to everyone on the call, uh, do people have antivirus programs on your Macs? Because there is that idea that once you have a Mac, you never have to worry about viruses. Uh, I'm not saying this is correct, but it, there is that kind of norm out there. So I know a lot of people are not as worried about viruses on, on Macs. Um, then we had a question about um, these kind of hoax emails that are circulated, that people get um, hoax uh, sent to themselves in their own email address. Uh, or they contain information that is kind of alarming. So um, if someone is saying here that their partners in India got an email that looked like an Indian, their, their own email that talked about Zoom safety. Um, and how, how do you identify that the email you have received is actually a phishing email or from, a phishing is someone who's trying to get hold of your information. How do you, um, how do you identify these fraudulent emails? So those were three questions. Do we have any more questions? Sorry, we had, uh, Sabo, you had raised your hand, but you've lowered it now. So I assume you had your question answered. Do you know, we have so many amazing digital safety trainers on this call. I, I can answer those, but I also would invite anyone who'd like to answer those on the call to feel free to do so. I think one of the important things that Jenny said is we're not experts. And as women who have been doing training in digital safety for a very long time, we've been told a lot that by digital safety experts as well. And what we have learned is that um, our bodies and our lives and especially specific bodies, certain people's bodies and lives have been under attack for so long. We have amazing strategies and we can apply those strategies to technology uh, and, and do in a lot of ways. And being dismissed or being told you have to be an expert to talk about these things can be really intimidating, especially for women. 
Um, so, so I want to encourage one, we have a ton of experienced trainers on this call, but also we know our own strategies and we know a lot of instinctful things. I'm happy to make some comments, but I just want to check if anyone else wants to go with that. I do not use a Mac. Um, but when I did use to have access to a Mac, I did use an antivirus because I was worried about um, scanning any file that I might emit from that Mac at, that could have a virus. So that in my case, I wasn't worried about my machine, but I was worried about um, uh, sending something onward to people who didn't have Macs. So that's why I used at that time an antivirus. But I think that that um, idea that an antivirus is gonna protect us from everything uh, is uh, something that's sold by antivirus companies. Um, <laughs> and then they tell you, and you need this, and you need this, and you need this for additional protection. And it's true because in fact, one of the critiques of Zoom is that the desktop application of Zoom gave a backdoor to Macs. And a backdoor access to Mac, uh, when, when people talk about a backdoor access, and I'm putting backdoor in quotes, it means that you have entry into your home, into your Mac, uh, your computer home, that allows you to pretty much be in the house and do what you want, um, take things from it, destroy things, et cetera. So this caused a great deal of alarm that Zoom didn't respond as quickly as it could have to that alert, which came out over a year ago, for example. Um, I believe that solution has been tackled by Zoom, and, uh, and, and, but I do encourage you to understand that it's not just antivirus that will protect our machines. And one of the examples that you're giving of phishing, um, which means when I say phishing, let me type it into the uh, chat so that people can also look this up. It's where you get things like an email, uh, you get a link, that really looks like something you need to check out. And, and so you click on it and it could be installing, nothing might happen. It could be installing a malicious program. It, and hopefully your antivirus would detect it, but it might not because they're new all the time. But the other thing that happens is it will maybe give you, um, it may make you seem like you logged out of your email or you locked out of your Facebook. And if this has ever happened to you where suddenly you're like, oh, I got knocked out of Facebook. Oh and you automatically start to fill in your information again, do not ever do that. It's really important to take a look at the URL or, or the, the link that is being showed to you to see if it is going to the place it says it's going to, whether that's a bank or Facebook. It's really important to take the time to type in the links to your services and not rely on um, someone giving you the link, say, just link here. You can take a look at what that link is trying to do and see if, if, if you're being asked suddenly to re-log into your Facebook, my strong recommendation would be to close that window and to open up another window or tab and see if you are truly logged out. Um, the, the trick of that, let's imagine if you clicked on a link and suddenly you feel like you got logged out of your you know, Facebook or, or your web page um, access and you're having to log in again, they are actually logging that information. You were never really logged out. This is the type of thing that happens with, with phishing. And I, I would strongly encourage you to, it does take more computer resources, but to use different browser windows to do certain things. Um, to separate if you're on email, to do your email in one browser window and open up another email to, uh, excuse me, another window to, to, to um, be on Facebook, et cetera. It might not be as convenient as switching tab, 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 but it is very helpful for your private spaces not to be compromised. Um, so if you have to link on something that you don't know what the link is, cut and paste that link and do it in an absolutely different window that's separate from your email link. Uh, it just is encapsulating, trying to encapsulate possible harm, um, but better not to click at all. Phishing is a really effective way of people gaining access to our accounts. It, I don't have statistics. Maybe someone in the chat would have statistics about how effective it is, but a lot of people get targeted phishing uh, so that malicious software can be installed a lot. Uh, we had this experience in Mexico where the government did targeted phishing to have you click on malicious links and install surveillance software. 
Um, and there is a lot of concern that is happening right now with COVID. We're all clicking on everything because it is a very concerning time. And now more than ever, we do have to pay attention to those links or really think about um, uh, if we need to make that link or if we can explore the news or the information about this app from another angle before clicking on anything because the downloads can become automatic and we can be in a malicious software incident um, if, if we do that uh, without examining the links. I don't know if that helped both the India question um, and some of this other safety concerns that have been mentioned and I'll uh, I think silence it again. Yeah, it helped a lot. I tried to set up like an example of what phishing is. So you would get something if you're following me on the screen or if you're on slide 25 in the questions I've written at the bottom phishing and it says log into your Facebook account and change your passwords. This is something typical that would happen in a phishing email and you can either like you can then it's hyperlinked and they usually hyperlink to something you know like Barclays or I, I don't know, Apple account or whatever. But then when you click on it, the link is actually something completely different. And this is what uh, Erika was just mentioning. So then instead of, you should never ever click on the link, but you can copy it. Um, so you copy the hyperlink, sorry, it doesn't show you now, but usually when you right click on it, then you can copy the hyperlink and then you open a completely new browser. You can go in incognito mode, for example, um, and insert it, but don't, click on it so it goes to that page. In that way you can see, is this actually, if this is coming from Facebook, is this actually a Facebook link? And I think I would like to add to that, but then I'm also opening up the floor to anyone else who's on the call. Um, you can also hover over the sender and usually if it says uh, it's coming from Facebook, but then the sender is, I don't know, last kiss 111555666, it's very often a troll. Okay, we have a question here. I think for me, one of the important things is to see safety as multidimensional. Uh, I mean, on one hand, we're vulnerable to trolls and those kinds of attacks from people out there online. And on the other, we're also needing to think about the safety of our data from surveillance, from being repurposed, reused, etc. Yes, I think that's a really good uh, like way of thinking about it. Do we have any Anyone else who is in the network who'd wanted to respond or fill in any gaps of what Erika said? I am mindful that we are past the hour, but please, I invite you all to stay on for a little bit longer. And for those of you who need to leave, we'll put this on YouTube later. But yes, if anyone else would like to add to what Erika was saying. So there are questions about, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Judith. Judith, you have to unmute your mic. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. Uh, I mentioned here in the in the text that when you go over with the mouse on the link, then you can also it appears. If you're going doing very slowly, you can see that what is the real link. And and then if you are uh, pushing properties, at least in Outlook, then you can see that who is the real sender of an email. So there are some, some ways to know who is the sender and, and what is the link to. And in, in Denmark, where I live, there is also uh, emails from banks and which are pretending they are banks and different things, ministries. So it is really, really bad now. And uh, I had a question, but maybe you take it later about the alternatives to Zoom. Uh, I think you maybe you will answer them later. I think maybe this is a good uh, question we can uh, actually look at now since we are running low on time. Um, so yes, anyone from the APC network who would like to fill in, what are some uh, uh, safety alternatives that we can use? I know Erica and Jenny were talking about open source um, open source apps and what could that, that be and do you have any specific one you would recommend? Uh, can you hear me still? 
Yes. Yes. Um, hi. Yeah. So I mean, I mentioned I mentioned Yitzi and this uh, farmer talk. They are both open source and free. I we 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 got recommendation for that. What do you think about them? Okay. Thank you so much, Judith. And then I think Jenny uh, started talking. Please go ahead, Jenny. Sorry, I was just trying to find the link to Jitsi. Now, I was going to put that out to everybody, like what their experiences have been. Um, we have used Jitsi, um, and that seems to be pretty good. Um, it's certainly uh, more secure than a lot of other platforms. But, you know, a lot of them have um, downfalls. Like, that wouldn't be able to hold a lot of people at the same time. Um, and it usually works better with some web browsers. Um, but yeah, if anyone has suggestions, we, um, Erica, I think the one we're testing is called uh, Big Blue Button. It's another one that um, is being tested. But, you know, one of the points around um, this is, is where these, um, yeah, no, in fact, Erica, I'm, I may be not talking, saying the right thing. But the big, big blue button is one, Jitsi. And I would like to ask other people what they, um, uh, are playing with or experimenting with or have used. So I think a lot of people are leaving just so you know, uh, but for those who are staying on, I very appreciated that. Uh, I see in the chat some people are suggesting Pharma Talk, Freema Talk, and then the link to Jitsi is being shared. Just a little side note that uh, for those of you who attended our last training, um, we have prepared this matrix with different types of uh, communication tools that you can use. And we are definitely going to include uh, Jitsi and any other suggestions you have into that matrix. And that will be included in the toolkit we're producing. Okay, so here's something I really, really want to stress. I, I do believe um, that we can look at who is owning the information, the, the tools that we're developing. And we need to know about safety concerns with all of them. But I think a lot of times we, we want to have the answer, what is the safest option? And if people in your network cannot communicate and their communication is cut off, because it didn't work for them, then that also affects safety. I know this is a really harsh thing to say. So I prefer Meet Jitsi, for example. But I know that if I am going to try to use video or screen on Meet Jitsi, I really won't be able to do anything with more than eight to 12 or 15 people if I'm lucky. Um, I also like Mumble, which is an audio uh, open source application and it can hold dozens if not hundreds of people. I've only been on calls of under a hundred people and it holds them very well, but it's only audio. It's not a screen sharing or video sharing tool and its functionality is not as easy um, for some people. And so it takes a little bit of introduction. So those are two examples, depending on what you're trying to do, that are incredibly useful. But who you need to reach out to and how is going to, and what their connectivity situation is, is going to affect you. And that's why Zoom is popular, because it does have very good audio for many different settings. And the reason, part of the reason why it does is the way they deliver their audio and the fact that they are not doing end-to-end -end encryption. So the whole time you're conversing, you are not as safe as you would be, if you want to use the word safe, on Meet Jitsi. Because people, um, it's not so easy uh, to, um, it is fully encrypted, excuse me, fully encrypted conversation. So when you say, what's my solution? What's the safest solution? Um, maybe you want to think about, as, as has been done with this amazing webinar organization, um, and I really applaud the whole series, you are using a platform that has safety considerations. You're warning about the safety considerations in Zoom, and you've talked a bit before about Zoom bombing. Uh, you are taking precautions to make sure that everybody feels as safe as they can be given these safety considerations. And, um, but you are able to then reach out to many people at once that you would not have been able to reach possibly using another tool. So I think that this is all of a balance and check situation. 
of um, how we use the how we what is our practice with the tools that are problematic or that we're concerned about how do we alert to those problems and concerns and make sure we are, are as safe as possible on them and also um, how can we move more sensitive processes, information, data, linking a network to smaller spaces that we can absolutely secure? And so that's, that's where it gets tough. Um, but with Zoom, for example, what has been done in terms of a password and a waiting room and registration, these are all key things. But if you're calling for a mass call and mobilization on a, a very pressing issue, time is going to make it very difficult. Um, to be able to keep the space as protective as our organizers have done. So again, uh, maybe you want to use WhatsApp a lot because it gets questioned as a, as a secure messaging service because it's onerous Facebook and because once it's backed up, uh, it's not encrypted any longer, just as two examples. And WhatsApp is using information, um, Facebook uses the information that it can gather from WhatsApp, not the conversations, those are encrypted, but the device and the phone number that are associated and they're selling that information. So people talk about other tools that they consider to be safer because that this sort of manipulation of, of, of uh, extra information isn't happening, such as wire or signal, and because they are also encrypted. It doesn't, but it is very important to think about our practice and who we can reach and who we are communicating with. So slowly people can move over to systems that you might feel safer with, and you can also go through a convincing process, but maybe you can't make that leap immediately. And it is very important to um, understand that there are safety aspects in everything. For me, it's about us individually all feeling safe and understanding our tech, but we don't want to say, oh, don't use Zoom, it's not safe, because then we're creating uh, perhaps more feelings of, of fear than saying, you know, Zoom has some of these problems. I use it, but I take these precautions. Um, and uh, what I like about Zoom is this or that. So, so I, I don't know if I'm communicating how important our practice and understanding that this is a process. And frankly, Zoom has responded to many of the security issues. Um, that doesn't mean it's not a corporate, private, code organization that we won't know a lot about what's going on unless they unless we find out there are vulnerabilities and that's problematic yay i think you're like putting the finger on everything that we tried to slightly tackle in our last call when we were going through the software and showing the different functions like why are we not allowing people to have private chats why are we not having the share documents and why should only co-hosts be able to share their screens so those kind of functions and um, for those of you who haven't who didn't attend the last session i really strongly um, suggest you do. The links are at the end of this document on slide 28. And you have the recording, but also the presentation. Um, I also think, sorry, I'm trying to go back to the questions. Um, no, I think it's, it's very important because we come back to this question about accessibility versus security. And it's unfortunately a little bit of a balance between the two, but I also really strongly think that if you learn and you look into these tools that you're using um, whereas there is a lot of shout outs to Zoom at the moment about everything that's wrong with Zoom, not to be alarmed by it, but to try and figure out um, how do you, what measures can you take to still make Zoom an accessible tool? Because we have seen that Zoom is so accessible to um, a lot of different types of constituencies and uh, it it just is a great tool in that sense but for example if you are to have more um, discussions that requires a little bit more security than then I would uh, for example that it suggests that you do something at Etsy or, or I don't know I've never tried Pharmatalk Mumbo but I'd love to do that um, I think this has been super helpful we're already 20 minutes past. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, me and Mara are putting together all of these resources into a toolkit from all three sessions. Um, we will try and capture anything that we haven't managed to answer in terms of questions during this call. Um, but there, yeah, I do think we need to 
quit the call, but I do have one question and it's something now Ed, that is very obvious is the digital divide and as a movement, how, what can we do to overcome this digital divide about who has access and who has not? Um, and how do we build that from in, within our own movement? Um, I, I think that is a question I would really like to explore, but perhaps we schedule another call for brainstorm on that. Um, as always on slide 26, for those of you following the virtual presentation, we have a feedback slide. The way you use the feedback is you take one of these post-it notes. So sorry, if you're following my screen share, you cannot do it. You have to actually go to the link. Uh, so I'll put the link in the chat box. And I invite you to take one of these post-it notes, you drag them from the corner, and then you, what you do is just start typing directly into it. And the question is, what do you still need training on? So if there's anything you feel that we haven't addressed in all of these, it can be specifically in terms of, of safety and digital safety and uh, feminist internet principles, but it can also be in the grander schemes of accessibility on the internet. Um, so my question, and I write this as an example, so Hannah, um, how, Uh, how do we overcome the digital access divide should be the word, right? And if anyone agrees with me, they can move a little heart. I would also like to know about that, etc. So I invite you to take a couple of moments to use this slide. And then, so you just drag one of the post-it notes into and then just start typing directly. Let me know if you have any question, uh, issues. Yes, so we have a question from Mara here in the chat box. And, I, and while you are all writing uh, on slide 26, um, I will open that up to the, our, all the members who are on this call is from APC. Um, how do we continue uh, learning from and engaging with APC and take back the tech, given that we are a very strong network, we have three networks merged into one, and we have such great people who uh, do a lot of advocacy, so whatever advocacy needs you need, how do we put that together, and also how do we streamline to make sure that our movement is uh, learning from all the great expertise you have from uh, all the work your members are doing. Um, Hannah, it's Jenny here. I think that it would be really good to do a, a kind of learning exchange between APC and um, WECF and WIDO. I think there would be a lot that we could we could learn. Um, so maybe we should uh, we should look at. Um, at a call around that, um, particularly around policy advocacy, because there's a lot of that work that APC does in, I'm sure, spaces that you also um, uh, participate in. Um, in terms of APC, you can subscribe to newsletters. Um, uh, same with Take Back the Tech, and Erica could speak to that. She's organized some amazing feminist learning circles. I'd be very um, uh, uh, happy to share um, some of uh, the work we're doing around the feminist technology exchange and digital safety with some incredible trainers that, that um, we work with and partner with. Um, and yeah, I mean, the feminist principles of the internet, people can sign up on the website and we can explore ways of, of um, looking at hosting different uh, spaces. So yeah, it would be a, a very, it would be very nice to, to see how we can take this collaboration further and learn from each other. Wonderful, that makes me so happy that it, I would love to continue that discussion. Anyone else? I, I invite you all to, if you have a question, to just turn on your mic. You don't even have to raise your hand. This is Mara. I also just wanted to hop in here at the end to thank our guest speakers and to put a last pin in the fact that 
similar to the other two calls, you all will receive a post call resources and recording email after this. That includes key accessibility information like text based versions of what we discussed today. I know that we will need to just try to transcribe the conversation today since it was mostly discussion based. Um, but also a really important part of that will be a survey at the end that will ask folks if there are other topics that Hannah and I were unable to explore with these three themes that you're still interested in learning about. We are very much um, excited about continuing this series and this conversation in whatever form that takes. So if there are themes that you feel like you want to learn more about or weren't covered at all, please let us know in that survey. Thanks all. Perfect. Thank you so much. Like, can we turn on the microphones and give a little round of applause to our guest speakers. So thank you so much. And as always, I invite you to turn on your video now since it's at the end of the call and we just do a quick, I'm going to pause my share. Um, yeah, wait a second. And yeah, I invite you to turn on the video so we can see you all. And do, well, I have a background, so it's a little bit messy. <laughs> I don't know why it like, looks at my teeth as my background. <laughs> but it's so nice to see you all. Bye. 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 Thank you Bye. all for joining. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Great. Thanks, Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye-bye.